I'm letting everyone in and I can be off. Ready to go when you are, Maria. Okay. Am I pinned as a? <laughs> yes. Oh, I shouldn't be. I think it's better if I have, you know, the similar position as everybody else. But hello, everybody. I'm really happy to welcome you today. I'm Maria. Many of you know me. I have recently become the president of the new exec, many of whom are here. You can recognize them. And this uh, event today is rather a continuation from an initiative that we took with the previous um, executive committee under the presidency of Sarah Green, when we thought that some topics we can discuss with our members in a more democratic way and think of solutions together. Um, and we did have a couple of webinars in the previous exact one was on the um, transition to open access with our journal and then there was the presentation also of um, our survey that Martin Fott published and since especially the last exec we have been trying to be more active and proactive on issues around lobbying especially European institutions and thinking of ways in which we engage with them, including on issues around, I mean, European national level and so forth, sponsoring institutions, um, including on levels around how funding is structured. And um, we have also had topics to discuss since the last two uh, AGM meetings, which have to do with um, the ethics of research and also with structural issues like precarity. So today we are continuing this discussion and we're thinking of this discussion in, in continuation with previous work that we've been doing to discuss something that's been on our mind for a very long time, which is the European Union gives a lot of money. It is taxpayers' money. It's not the European Union's money to us as researchers to um present our research to to do research to collect data and there is a, an increasing push as you would all know about impact about doing policy uh with our research which is all great um except the problem is when does the european union actually listen to us when it comes to our research and the problem is, as we would be discussing here, that it mostly doesn't, and we need to find ways to make it accountable to us as taxpayers, as researchers, as and to the communities that we work with. So on that note, and, and also like what, what I think is another very pertinent topic for us is the question of what happens to scholars who are at risk and who are migrants themselves, who are suffering from displacement and from extreme political precarity. And when arriving to Europe and to you know, more secure geographies are also starting to suffer economic precarity because the European structures and you know, stipends are short term and they're not offering permanent escape and um, shelter. So on that note, um, I'd like to give the word to our exec member, Chara Makaremi, um, who will be leading this discussion and who has been a voice that we have followed in it. 
and um, she would present the speakers and chair the discussion. And I'm looking forward to that. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to be taking part in my first uh, EASA webinar. And um, I uh, will just start by presenting our uh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, guest today. Uh, so we have uh, with us Céline Kampa and uh, Barak uh, Kallir. Uh, Céline holds a PhD in social science from the University of East London. Her work focuses on migration, human humanitarianism, solidarity mobilization, and uh, she has done field research and actually very, very active observant participation, I would say, on pro-migrant movement in France, Italy, and the UK, but also along the Balkan route. Another interest of her is higher education and the politics of university access. She has been a postdoctoral researcher at the Central European University in Budapest and in the MAGIC ERC program, so the, the program on migration governance and asylum crisis at uh, Sciences Po in Paris, where she is currently an academic advisor at the Paris School of International Affairs. And Barak is an associate professor in anthropology at the University of Amsterdam. He is the co-director of the Institute for Migration and Ethnic Studies, and is currently involved in the H2020 project, Advancing Alternative Migration Governance. Um, Barak recently rounded off an ERC-funded project entitled The Social Life of State Deportation Regime. And um, among other publications, he recently co-edited a special issue of social anthropology uh, called Researching Access, what do attempts at shooting migration control tell us about the state? And of course, he is the co-author with Celine of a thought-provoking article published in Crisis Magazine in May 2020, entitled Fund but Disregard, the EU's relationship to academic research on mobility. Uh, which raises crucial questions we would like to discuss further here in this seminar. So uh, without further delay, I leave the floor to Barak and Celine. And my understanding is that um, Barak will first draw further on their argument uh, developed in this uh, article and, and also on the petition that was uh, submitted to the Commission. And Celine will then put this debate in the wider context of research management and funding politics in the EU. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Chara. Thank you, Maria and, and the executive for arranging this uh, uh, webinar. Um, let me maybe start by putting a bit the, the article that Celine and I wrote in the context of the letter that we also sent. Maybe many of you are also signatories to it. Uh, but for those who are not uh, aware of the bigger context, so the immediate trigger that um, pushed us to write this letter to the EU president was the outbreak of uh, COVID-19 last year, around uh, February. Um, as you mentioned, Chara, I was, uh, I'm still working in a Horizon 2020 project that is called uh, Advancing Migration, uh, Advancing Alternative Migration Governance. So, uh, and we're working with many universities in Europe and beyond, and we were uh, all taken by the outbreak of COVID-19 and what does that mean for people that are, uh, for border crossers that are uh, stranded in makeshift camps and hotspots and detention centers. And we felt like we needed to do something um, beyond what we, each of us did maybe as, uh, as, a, as a citizen, we thought we want to do something as academics. Um, and then we were talking within the project and I have to give actually most credit to our Greek uh, colleagues. They were actually leading on it, uh, especially my colleague, uh, uh, professor of anthropology in the Aegean University, Akis uh, Papastariagis. Um, and we thought, okay, we, we don't wanna put another digital petition out there or just send an open letter or make this kind of a public statement. But we thought we wanna actually do something like send a direct letter with uh, being a bit audacious to the EU president. And we also um, actually directed it to four other commissioners that we thought are relevant for the issue. 
And what we put in the letter, the letter is public. I can also drop it in the chat uh, for those who don't uh, well, haven't had the chance to look at it. And we basically said, look, uh, we have accumulated uh, tons of knowledge from EU funded projects that we were engaged in. And we want to put this knowledge at your disposal. I mean, this is again, yet again, another crisis, another emergency um, uh, moment. And we have uh, gathered so much uh, information and knowledge on things like humanitarian borders and camps and hotspots and detention and deportation and solidarity movement and the interface with civil society and uh, the role of subcontracting private companies. So why don't you take all this knowledge that we have and we're gonna help you. So it was a very proactive kind of letter. And we're gonna help you try to do the best in, in the kind of means and, and time that we have. Um, and our idea was to send a soft call among our network so that we ask for signatories to this letter to be people that are actually working either as leading or researching within a EU funded project. So we were thinking like whoever worked uh, in FP7, what is nowadays uh, Horizon 2020, or an ERC grant or a Marie Curie. So people that like our leverage, the leverage that we looked for was like, you invested money in us. We, we accumulated knowledge, expert knowledge. And now we wanna put this knowledge back to you so that you can do the best policies in this kind of a yet again crisis moment. Um, so although it was a soft call and we wanted to move on it very fast within something like um, two days, we got 60 signatures. Uh, so we were very happy and we uh, basically sent off the letter because time was also of the essence. Uh, after that, we also published the letter more publicly uh, and within two weeks, something like that, we got another 300 scholars asking to join the, the letter as signatories. Um, so we were overwhelmed not only by how, uh, how many people wanted to join the letter, but also a lot of people voluntarily started to share with us the kind of stories of frustrations that they had, very similar to those that drove us to write the letter in the first place, like being working on, on, on this kind of a very burning issues in the migration uh, field and never being heard by or taken up by uh, policymakers ever, not in their national context and not in the EU context. And then we got this call from uh, Crisis Magazine. And by the way, it's a fantastic magazine that is uh, not supported by any commercial uh, um, uh, parties. It's run by, uh, it's co-founded by Donia uh, Aliniad, who contacted us and asked us if we want to write a piece more like reflecting on the experience of uh, trying to push this kind of uh, leverage on the EU, which then Celine and I did. And um, I think the piece is highlighting two uh, important things. Um, I will speak mostly only about one. I think maybe Celine will speak more about the other, or maybe we pick it up also in the discussion more. So the first one that I will not speak so much about is the need for, for accountability mechanism, a structural mechanism in how the, what is the uptake of uh, EU funded research? So if so much money goes into it, and just maybe to give an idea, uh, between 2014 and 2020, uh, 3 billion euro went into funding research on uh, the topic of asylum, migration, and integration in the European Union. 3 billion euro. I mean, we can only imagine what else can have been done with that money, but fine, it was put into doing research. So we were like thinking, okay, with all that kind of money that is poured into doing research, uh, what is actually being done with it? And to our frustration, we, we I think, all realized that very little is being done for it. And again, we can all talk maybe later and discuss why that is the case. I just want to give like one example from my from a field that is very close to my research. So if we take if we think about how detention is being um, put into a policy in the EU, then the 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 standard uh, period for detaining illegalized migrants for the sake of deportation now in the EU was put at 18 months. And that was done by the recast of the return directive a couple of years back. And at that point, 
it pushed 21 member states to actually put higher the, the period of detention, uh, mandatory detention for uh, deporting illegalized migrants because they had it lower than 18 months. And in my research, uh, we asked a lot of practitioners in the field, uh, what is the reasonable, I mean, people that are running detention centers or deportation units in different EU member states. And we asked them like, what is the reasonable time that you need to detain someone for deportation? And the answer is systematically, almost in every EU member state that we did research in, was in between two to three months. So, and, and you have to think that like some of the countries that deport most illegalized migrants in Europe, like France and Spain, for many years, the, the maximum length of detention of illegalized migrants was 45 days or 60 days. So from that kind of a length, the European Union decided to put it at 18 months. And also now with the Migration and Asylum Pact, the minimum standard was actually put up to three months in the first time you detain an illegalized migrants. Totally contrary to any evidence that we ever gathered empirically by doing research that is funded by the EU. So this kind of disparity or this kind of gap between what we find as researchers and what the EU then uh, translate into policies, I think this is one very worrying thing that merit a lot of discussion thinking, uh, why is that the case? And can we do something about it to sort of force structurally the EU to be accountable to at least respond to what we find when we do research with EU money. And the second part, the second point that I think came out uh, very strongly from our reflection in the piece, and I wanna talk a little bit more about that is um, basically the, the, the question of like, why do we still produce so much knowledge on oppressive mobility regimes with money from the EU? Of course, it relates to the first one. I mean, we are very frustrated about what actually happens with this research. So we really have to ask ourselves, why, why are we still doing it? And here, I, I think there are three main reasons that we can think like that's why we're doing it. And uh, I will just run by the three. I will refute the first two and, and make the point about the third one. So I think the first point would be that we do it for scholarly purposes. So basically to, to push academic debates, to fashion new understanding, to come up with new concepts, to educate our students about uh, what's happening and um, this kind of more like internally scholarly academic purposes. Uh, but then to just refute it, I think that for this purpose, we definitely don't need millions of euros to do this kind of huge project in order to get to this kind of uh, scholarly debate. And at, uh, and in addition, I also personally think that like the urgency of the, the subject matter, the fact that uh, what we are actually researching is the horrible uh, inhumane condition in which so many thousands of people are amongst us are uh, living. I think that this kind of a scholastic purpose cannot be like the main thing why we say that we need so many millions of, of euros to do research uh, on this topic. So that would be for me like a, a no-go. The second one is that um, we hope to have social impact. We are also, of course, anyone who ever wrote a grant in the last years knows that this is like an essential thing. You have to show what kind of a social impact your project will have. And then you have to dance a lot around it to eventually show that supposedly you had social impact. Whereas in uh, practice, we all know that uh, our social impact is very um, minimal and uh, there again, just to refute that as the main reason why we go for this huge grant. Um, I don't think here again, we need millions of euros in order to have a, a, what we called in the social sciences, at least the social impact, which basically boils down to informing public opinion, to uh, writing op-eds or I don't know, appearing on TV uh, every now and then. Uh, I don't think we need so many millions for that. And I think uh, at the same time, there are like public intellectuals that are doing a much better job than us on that, right? Many of them, by the way, are ex-academics uh, that are working now in journalism or in ass-kicking NGOs and uh, social movements and migrant platforms. And I think they are doing it very well. And, and to be very honest, I think much better than most of us academics. So that would, again, not be for me a reason why uh, we're still producing so much knowledge for the uh, with EU money. So then I want to get to the third point that um, 
that is basically that we're doing it for our own career. And now I'm speaking from my very personal experience. I think that um, having a, a, a very big grant, so uh, I had an ERC grant, is definitely something that secures your tenure position. It secures actually a promotion in the hierarchy in academia, uh, which is very much, these things are very much nowadays, as we all know, dependent on bringing big, big money on bringing the grants in so we are actually all playing in this kind of a show me the money academic sector right and uh, i think this is a very big incentive of why a lot of us are actually doing this kind of research or going for these big grants uh, we also all know that if you win one of these big grants that you get more more time to publish to advance your career in that respect you have to teach less you are invited to more conferences or you can put conferences yourself if you like to because you have all this money so it actually also enhances this dynamic of the winner takes it all which uh, i think is a very neoliberal dynamic uh, there is also a pet dependency there if you got one big grant the chances that you will get another big grant is actually higher so the competition with all your colleagues is also not on a fair uh, um, playing level field um so it, it just sort of reproduced this idea that uh, this uh, very competitive neoliberal uh, academic field uh, and this is basically my conclusion or what i want to leave my very short uh, uh, talk with that coming out of my year sigran my biggest feeling is that i was uh, taking part in in very actively in contributing to the social reproduction of a very sick academic field and um just to also put some uh, points here uh, that it's not just a feeling i mean something in the range of 20 to 40% of every big grant uh, money goes by now uh, to overheads of university bureaucracy right and uh, if I'm very honest with myself, I don't think my research at the end of the, uh, the day had such a big social impact that I can say that it merits so much uh, of the EU budget. Um, and yeah, so uh, and another just reflection on my side on that kind of a big project. I also don't think that anthropology actually stands to benefit so much from running this kind of huge project. I have a feeling that most of the research that I did before, like a very small scale research that concerned mostly myself and having a budget, it mostly meant that I can buy a flight ticket somewhere or go there by train, was more than enough for me to do that kind of knowledge production that I was after. And this kind of playing with the big grants is also just like us showing that we can do the same. Something that again, I think is at the end of the day, quite um, insatisfying and even self-defeating. So with this uh, a bit uh, more uh, pessimistic uh, note, I think I will uh, conclude my uh, contribution and uh, pass it on to Celine. Uh, thanks, Barak. And thanks so much, uh, Shora and Maria and the uh, executive committee of the ASA for the kind invitation. Uh, as Shara said, in the next 15 minutes, I will just try to connect our reflections that uh, Barak just uh, presented. Uh, on the politics of EU research funding to some broader issues, perhaps some of the issues of interest to the ESA, their implication for academic labor, for academic freedom, which uh, Barak also touched upon. And maybe it's interesting that in a way I have a very different position to Barak's because I'm, uh, I'm not a tenured anthropologist, I'm not even a researcher anymore, I, uh, I'm still in higher education, but in an altogether different kind of position. Um, so some of the implications, I think, uh, of, you know, the mechanism of EU funding are a little bit different for people who are still in the earlier stages uh, of academic careers. Um, but anyway, those are just a set of, uh, of ideas I wanted to share, which perhaps can provide avenues for, uh, for collective reflections. And one thing I want to do is just to go back over um, the trajectory of my own encounters with the European Commission in relation to migration research, because probably as many others, uh, I first encountered the European Commission as an object or a subject of a study and not primarily as a, as a funding uh, body. So during my PhD research, I was looking at uh, how migration solidarity groups 
where we're organizing across borders against or in the context of the Europeanization of border and migration policies. So sort of social movement uh, dynamics and the evolving practices as a legal frameworks uh, so go governing migration and migrants in the EU are evolving. Um, and obviously the European Commission then was a key actor because of its role in uh, actualizing uh, an exclusionary reading of a European identity, uh, mobilizing migrants as figures of otherness, um, and also as one of the targets <laughs> against which uh, my participants were organizing. Um, so I think the reflections that I developed in my doctoral research about you know, what kind of desirable political identities and subjectivities and forms of actions were active in the field of migration also helped me to think through uh, the politics of EU research funding in relation to migration. So which research becomes valued and listened to, which becomes neglected, disciplines or perhaps even criminalized. Um, and so, you know, I think thinking about the politics of, uh, of EU research funding is also about uh, reflecting on who gets funding for, for what project in affiliation with which institution, under which uh, conditions this research is carried out, and of course, what happens to, to the knowledge produced with this money. And that's the sort of second capacity in which I encountered the, the European Commission, because uh, I uh, obtained a Marie Curie uh, research fellowship after finishing my PhD. Uh, indeed, as many of my peers, obtaining my PhD meant entering the competitive race for postdocs and short-term academic contracts that supposedly allows us to survive academically and uh, materially until we get the permanent position and this uh, sort of stability materializes. And as I said, in my case, actually it didn't materialize and I moved on to doing uh, other things. Um, and I got that grant, as uh, we explained in the piece with uh, Barak, to continue research into migration solidarity practices along what had emerged as a key focus of both academic research and European policymaking at the time in a context of crisis, uh, namely along the, the so-called Balkan route. So, you know, I found myself in that position, which I think many of us have experienced, where the European Commission funded me to, you know, criticize the practices and policies that it was developing, uh, which, you know, arguably is an ambivalent position, uh, which we need to negotiate, but I'm not at all overstating the uniqueness of this contradiction, because uh, Barack, you were also looking at uh, deportation policy, and you were funded by the EC to essentially criticize <laughs> um, it, it, the, the sort of uh, political approach it put towards um, those uh, migrants. Um, but what was interesting for me in that process um, was that the, the sort of uh, many steps I went to through get funding, because the first time I was rejected, which is again, I think, a very common experience. And therefore, I was encouraged to attend a number of workshops on, you know, how to apply for EU funding, how to perform, you know, research professional identities in relation to the kind of desirable type of uh, postdoc opportunities, funding opportunities that exist. I reworked my proposal to give a more <laughs> project form to my research idea, to turn it into something that's more sellable, that's more recognizable to the sort of uh, EU uh, framing of, uh, of what good research is. And as Barak said, and, uh, and we try to discuss in our piece, this crucially includes featuring a range of policy related uh, impacts and deliverables. So of course I, I play that uh, game uh, and I included all those uh, policy uh, impact um, type of, um, of uh, deliverables, which you know, at the time of writing, I, I already knew <laughs> were absolutely meaningless and uh, would never be taken up. And I think the, the fact that uh, the content or the topic of the research uh, was to a large extent secondary, or at least not more fundamental than the design of the research and the format of the research uh, was always very clear to me and probably to many of us as we write this proposal. And in fact, at least as a Marie Curie fellow, you are not even required to submit any of your academic outputs throughout uh, your two or three years of funding. So it was only at the very end that uh, we had to produce this kind of massive report, which took us, you know, weeks and which we never received any comments <laughs> or feedback about. Uh, and I know other types of scientific uh, projects have uh, more scientific academic committees, but actually for Marie Curie, there is no monitoring or feedback mechanism regarding what you produce in terms of content. Um, and the 
final deliverable of this project, which you know has been had been centralized as a as a key feature to secure funding in my proposal, was a policy brief on how to include some of the insight from solidarity practices I'd been uh, analyzing and observing into migration policies. And uh, that's really the point uh, when the sort of absurdity and uh, the violence of the situation became unbearable since uh, by the time I finalized my, uh, my project, all the solidarity sites which I had studied between 2017 and 19 had essentially been decimated. Uh, and many, if not all of them, directly or indirectly through uh, European funding or through the actions and decisions uh, of politicians that sat uh, in the European Commission. So at the time I didn't want, and I refused to write this policy brief and instead wrote a brief paper, which was called something like, why are policy briefs meaningless? And then I imagine no one ever read it. And, and I can be case no one ever asked for, you know, the promised policy briefs. And then when I finished my Marie Curie, I, I was invited to be an evaluator for H2020 and the Marie Curie project proposals. And so I sort of moved to the other side of the, or to another position within the, 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 the funding site. Um, and it was also very interesting and intriguing, intriguing to see how funding allocation happens from inside or from that perspective. I believe there's a bit of a field of struggle there, which brings together academics and scholars acting as evaluators, partly <laughs> as I did in the hope that, you know, you could channel some of this, mon this money towards a worthy project or researchers that might need it, but who still have to operate under a set of uh, bureaucratic rules and uh, sort of supervisory structures and uh, under which academic knowledge production and academic critique do become marginal matters. Like we are looking for how proposal tick certain boxes uh, and not necessarily for, you know, <laughs> a critical evaluation of the content. And in fact, uh, we receive a, a set of uh, guidelines and the European Commission Research Director Directorate defines good research in those guidelines as research that improves Europe's competitiveness, boosts its growth, creates jobs, and tackles you know, current and future societal challenges. So in that sense, we see that this question that Barak, you also raised of you know, the public and, and social role of research is already resolved in a very specific way. And the fundamental question of you know, what form of political and economic community we operate in or we want to operate towards is sort of already posited as a, some kind of unquestionable uh, framework. Um, and the sort of uh, discussion happens after this has been established. So we just sort of remain uh, involved in discussion on how to adjust a set of procedures to, you know, assess research in the most uh, governable way, transparent way, uh, to make research funding allocation a sort of fair process. But the, the sort of uh, biggest question of the relation of research to, uh, to politics and to society is, uh, is never, never raised and never asked. And I mean, of course, there are margins of negotiations when you are within that process, but I think key issues are just removed from uh, any kind of public or, or political debate. Um, and of course, as, as Barack also said, uh, the reproduction of this system is related to, to broader shifts in conditions of uh, academic uh, labor, the withdrawal of public funds, the increasing reliance on private or European money, which uh, as Barria reminded us of is public money. Uh, but nonetheless, the fact that we uh, are in more and more precarious position when it comes to finding stable uh, publicly funded uh, position at the national level. And the, you know, every year the number of proposals received under each of these funding streams in the EC, the number goes up. And this is always seen as a sign of the efficiency and the success of the European vision for, for research. I think uh, it's often something the European Commission boasts about. So I remember last year it was like, oh, we've, received, we've broken the record like three years in a row for the number of uh, Marie Curie proposals we've received. Um, of course, we also know that this is because there are very little other options for uh, essentially junior scholars to secure any form of uh, income. But I think, you know, the, the relation between EU funding and uh, academic labor condition as actually different uh, aspects. It's, uh, as you said, Barak actively reproducing the, the neoliberal uh, academia. And I experienced this also as, a, as an evaluator. 
I remember, for instance, making that comment on the uh, H2020 proposal that I was evaluating that it obviously, uh, it was obvious that it was a project that was set up in a way that would lead to extremely exploitative conditions for postdocs because there was insane number, you know, of uh, deliverables to submit, very lit little human resources. And actually the point was outly rejected by uh, the European Commission person that was coordinating uh, the evaluation. And I was told that we are assessing a proposal against a set, uh, a set uh, list of criteria which don't include work conditions and uh, this is basically irrelevant and that's not part of you know, the way that uh, the European Commission uh, evaluates research proposals. And of course, uh, you know, even a step further, when EU funding becomes a crucial source of income for us, and I, I, I see what you said, Barack, about the source of prestige, but for some of us, it's also a source of sort of uh, basic material reproduction. Uh, we become increasingly dependent on our ability to sort of fulfill and perform this vision of research and research career and evolution that's promoted by the EU. And therefore, in our on our ability to you know, present ourselves as fundable and therefore our ability to show that we can produce policy impact along those already determined lines. And in the field of migration, that really raises very important question about how do we speak to those policymakers in a way that could be accounted as uh, you know, allow, account, uh, amounting to policy impact. Um, and, and I think Shara will comment further on this in a minute, but this means reproducing very specific representations and ideas and languages to, to speak about migrant and migration. Because the only way to indeed be heard by people who are sitting as policymaker in the commission is to reproduce or reiterate those very exclusionary, violent, sometimes murderous tropes. So we have to annex our way to, to speak about the social world, to analyze the social world, to conduct research basically uh, to pre-existing politics, which are <laughs> Uh, often not necessarily the one we want to reproduce. And I think it's very perverse the way in which the honest then falls on researchers, you know, to develop more skills and show more persistence and attend more training workshop and present better facts in better ways with more images and colors and graphs, because this is the sort of um, benchmark against which the quality of their research is going to be assessed. And they are sort of stuck in a catch-22 position where that inability to change policy making is seen as a reflection on the bad quality of their research, as if uh, policy making happened outside of any politics or outside of any ideological framework. Um, and again, you know, I, I think many of us working on migration would remember the numerous uh, conferences that we had to attend between, especially the post so called migration crisis period, where you know, act academics were invited to, to meet policymakers. And in particular, I remember seeing some of my colleagues questioning the language of policymakers around, you know, the production of illegality and how we speak about uh, people produced as illegalized, as you were saying, uh, Barak. Uh, and, and us as a scholar is literally being told that, you know, no dialogue is possible as long as we refuse to speak the rational language of the commission that reflects an existing factual reality. There are legal people, there are illegal people. If we can't even agree on this, there's no point in even uh, continuing the dialogue. So, I mean, it has this very disciplinary effect. And perhaps that's the last point I wanted to go to. Like, this is also, of course, an issue of academic freedom at that point about how we are uh, allowed or authorized uh, or valued in the way that we speak about things and the, the, the sort of research we put forward. And this is something we tried to explore uh, with um, in a recent piece with uh, our friend and colleague, Pinar Donmez, who is uh, here today, I think. Uh, and we're drawing on the work of se several colleagues, including Maria's, uh, about you know, thinking about how the reproduction of uh, neoliberal academia and academic precarity is also essentially a discussion about what would constitute appropriate material conditions for meaningful knowledge to be produced and valued. So trying to move beyond you know, very like abstracted liberal understanding of academic freedom and come back to the material uh, means by which we can <laughs> be in position to produce socially meaningful knowledge today. And I think it's just um, interesting that in this short piece, which came out in Radical Philosophy with Pinar, we explain how we were actually suspended by our then university, the Central European University in 2018, 
after a law had been adopted uh, in Hungary that threatened to levy a tax on uh, organizations that promoted, and I quote, uh, positive visions of migration. And at the time, both our positions were short-term contracts funded by European money. Pinar was working as a Erasmus Plus, on an Erasmus Plus project on access to higher education for displaced students. And I was conducted migration solidarity research. So our research was essentially criminalized. Our institution performed the criminalization. And at the time, CU had emerged you know, in the global discourse around the higher education as this uh, last bastion of academic freedom in the liberal East. And the suspension of a few you know, temporary staff did not weaken at all the liberal aura of the university, and it did not at all alter its uh, self-representation as you know, the best university in the region, as testified by its ability to attract EU funding precisely. You know. So while it's become a source of liberal prestige for the institution, this European funding did not even protect us. <laughs> in against the criminalization of our most basic activities like doing research and teaching. So this is not necessarily a more <laughs> positive conclusion than, than yours, Barak, but I, I think it just points to the fact that it's very urgent that we have those political and uh, critical conversation about the politics of European research funding, not just because it reproduces neoliberal academia or commodified higher education, but because it also does very little, if not sometimes participate in reproducing authoritarian politics. And I think this uh, <laughs> leads the way to, to Shara's points. So I'll uh, leave you the floor and uh, thanks again. Thank you very much, uh, Celine, and, and thank you, uh, Barak, for, uh, for these uh, uh, elements that, that, that set the, the, the discussion. So. Um, um, maybe I will just, uh, as we prepare this uh, uh, this webinar, I, I um, uh, discuss about an element that uh, uh, maybe uh, has a, a part to play in the in the general picture. So I will uh, uh, both bring in uh, this uh, this element, but also maybe uh, uh, react a little bit. I mean, open up the discussion uh, uh, before giving the floor to the. Uh, 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 to the participants, to the other participants. Uh, so there, is, there are two things I would I would have liked to like. So wanting to add and and, and the reaction uh, when you're talking, Celine, about uh, these uh, uh, technocracy of uh, research management and funding and 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 what is the conception of uh, uh, of research and research impact within this uh, uh, this universe. Um, I, I thought it was important to just remind uh, a, um, a discussion that I had, uh, uh, an interview I had with uh, a jurist, uh, Elstead Gilles, who has been counseling, actually, advising the, the EU, EU Parliament, but also the EU Commission on uh, uh, migration laws for, for more than 20 years. So she has a critical uh, approach that she developed with Didier Bigo in many uh, publications around specifically uh, the, the Schengen visas. Uh, in the in the in the early uh, years 2000, but as she was reflecting back on her experience, she was highlighting how the Commission is so the 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 DJ Home and the European Commission, the decision makers within the European Commission that are working on migration are not uh, uh, neutral, objective bureaucrats, and then you would have to learn to speak their language, and so you could push forward your ideas. But if you go back to the history of how DG Home was solidified, crystallized after uh, the, the Amsterdam Treaty in 99, and how uh, which uh, uh, gives to the to the EU some prerogatives on asylum and migration control, then what happens in reaction is that the most conservative and anti-migrant, basic anti-migrant views uh, move from the uh, interior ministry to the member state interior ministry onto the commission. So there, there has been a political move and we're not facing a neutral objective rational legal Bavarian bureaucracy that you know, we have to, to, to learn to speak to, but we really have to, to also be conscious and also research can you know, help dig out uh, uh, that process uh, uh, of who are we facing? Who, like, what is the politics and what is the ideology? Like she was 
so so this 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 Jewish legal scholar was using very uh, a radical wording of the DG home. The commission has been colonized by anti-migrants too, and this is what explains the gap between knowledge production or basic, not even knowledge production, but basic uh, 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 assessment of reality and figures that are produced by EU bodies themselves such as Eurostat. So we are not even going into physical research. But there is a gap with those uh, data uh, 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 that report on migration and the decisions that are made. So um, uh, one thing was that. So how do we take that into account? And the other thing uh, uh, um, uh, was maybe to start the discussion, my reaction to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Barack's provocative uh, uh, point on, on uh, the function of uh, research funding uh, uh, in the in the in the power knowledge relation, uh, and and just uh, I had the, the impression that here, so so basically the money is there. The research, as Celine explained, research goes through project funding, and this is a trend that we cannot reverse in the in, in the present situation. So we will we are not able to convince our member states, our our, our state, the, the state of the universities we are in, we're not able to convince them to go back and fund you know, universities and, and research centers, et cetera. Uh, everything goes into those ERC programs and et cetera. So uh, uh, this is the case. So if we don't do critical research with that, then you know, other kinds of research will be done with that. And um, um, just, I'm, I'm, I'm talking from the point of view of someone who has done her PhD and postdoc on critical migration, critical border studies, and who deserted that field. Like I stopped doing research on that and I'm not going back because exactly because I thought that we have enough research. We have enough knowledge. Now, you know, we have to disseminate it and to, and to, and to make impact. But, but still, uh, uh, I got an ERC program to work on Iran because I, I, I had the impression that getting the EU money uh, was a way for me in the in the knowledge power relationship was a way for me to to change uh, power relations within the field of Iranian studies. So to 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 and and I'm afraid that if we desert, you know, that that the funding and these programs, what will become of the power relations, the intellectual academic power relations, uh, different trends, schools of thought, uh, methodologies, etc., within uh, uh, the academic fields we're in. And also uh, the argument that Barak you're making about the social impact. So uh, maybe maybe public intellectuals are doing better the job of academics, but but they're not doing it well enough because you know uh, uh, as Celine was reminding, any every European society is on the verge of of of, of fascism, and uh, uh, or already permitted by fascism. So they're not doing it en enough. And 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 the fact that we are all failing public intellectual and academic as also sometimes public intellectual, we are, all, we are failing now, uh, is not an argument. I mean, it's not the same kind of argument for me. This, this failure argument is not the, the same kind, kind of argument than the, than the, than the other argument. So, so there is a failure we have, that we have to acknowledge. And, and I don't see any other response to that than you know, fail again, fail better, because um, uh, it's not as if we had many choices. Is that it's not as if uh, uh, there were many. So, so the rudder head is what it is, and our societies are what they are. So, what? Um, uh, how do we rethink the relationship between academic knowledge production and uh, uh, social uh, uh, and, and political uh, uh, participation? Uh, this is not. I don't think this is a subject we can escape. And uh, so, so my question was about. And also, just just to finish that, the other actors that are uh, uh, in, uh, um, that that participate in creating this social impact and and that are not successing uh, either, uh, they face the same problem than the academics. Because I'm thinking about, for instance, the NGO I did my my research with uh, within a, a migrant detention facility in France, the ANAFE, and they got funding from the EU. Not, not, you know, to, to of course, to, to, to help uh, resist against uh, 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 police uh, uh, control in the uh, waiting zone, but because they were creating jobs for young Europeans, because they were doing, giving legal tra train, training to their uh, volunteers and they were creating these jobs. So these, these problems, these 
uh, functioning that you're pointing out of career, of funding, of the relationship is something that other uh, uh, um, fields uh, that are engaged in social resistance, social resistance are, are facing as well. So this, this was my kind of uh, uh, reaction. And maybe we can open up the, 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 the discussion because we, we have a, a generous 30, 35 more minutes. So maybe we can give, uh, take more reactions and questions before uh, uh, giving you back the floor, if it's okay with you. So uh, thanks for this and just maybe, you know, it would be nice if people write in the chat if they have questions, just so that they can come up and be elevated to speakers. That's why we did it. You know, we made the whole seminar webinar on Zoom so that people can switch their cameras themselves and come to the quote unquote podium. Um, so I'd be really happy if more people get involved, but I can also, you know, kind of come back to some of the points while we're waiting for others to maybe join in. And um, so I think the, the point that Chara just made about, um, you know, deserting the, the, the field and that. So, so I think in ASA at present where our debate with also lobby group stands is that we are increasingly trying to think of how to turn turn the clock back, how to return some of the funding to universities. Of course, I mean, there is a bigger problem there. So universities, you know, it, it we're much beyond the time when universities are these pristine public institutions that are just, you know, deprived from funding from national governments. Um, as Barak mentioned, we are dealing with big redistribution of public funds into private hands. So a lot of the funding is public. We are made to compete for it in a rat race. When the universities get funding, they put 40% into overheads. And a lot of these overheads are not money that comes back to departments that have won the funding or schools that have won or let alone being redistributed, say, to disciplines that are not competitive in these bigger grants, like I know classics and music maybe. But but instead they are, they become part of a bigger pot of gold that is then given into public private partnerships. And then we have dorms, and then we have new campuses that are built, and then we have more surveillance mechanisms and data collection that is happening through all sorts of you know new partnership with uh, devices, with big tech companies and so forth. So, so where we are at is that we have to renegotiate the whole question of you know what is done with this funding so from the individual point of view perhaps the question is you know do you engage at all do you have the choice to not engage as, as Celine said you know you, it is a rat race you are in a position to secure especially as an early career academic funding as in only way into a kind of very insecure job market but on the other there is a bigger debate you know what do universities do with this money that, that we win and would we be able if we bring it back to universities to make them more accountable about how first you know the money is spent and secondly to make funders and to make universities as funders more accountable to what they do with our findings how do we so how do we turn the conversation the other way around and we ask why aren't they accountable to us they have they have appointed us we are the we're the specialists really experts even if we don't like that word you know we we do have this vibe around you know even in very participatory research some knowledge that's produced that is valuable why can't we hold the european union accountable to actually get get involved in implementing this knowledge but so so now we're kind of in a conversation i think where we have to think of what are the mechanisms to actually pose this as a more pertinent question back to these institutions, both internally in universities and, and to funding bodies. So, so that would be how I personally, and, and hopefully, you know, I as an organization in, engages in this field. So how do we make ourselves heard? Because we have to be heard. <laughs> you know? And because we have to renegotiate 
the way funding structures function because they are not function functioning for the public yeah Chris, do you want to please stand up and ask your question also publicly so that we can continue the discussion more live? Hello, hi there. I, I don't know if there's a good um, microphone on this computer, whether you can hear me or it's a new machine. Hey, thanks for the the, uh, the intervention, Celine and Barak. I thought it's really interesting. I, I just wanted to intervene in this conversation about... <laughs> Why we, I mean, firstly, I don't think we should be surprised that the EU doesn't have any built in mechanism for, for trying to um, pick up on and, and receive and act upon our kind of knowledge. I mean, that, I think they probably view themselves as brokers, mediaries, uh, intermediaries between, you know, the nation state, national governments, and funding bodies. I don't think they even, they probably don't even have the capacity. To, um, you know, to, to take to, to listen and read to all our um, kind of outputs uh, and then to, uh, um, to act on them. It'd be, be good to, as, you, as you're saying now, to, to actually suggest that maybe this should be something that they should include in their budgetary uh, spending plan, some sort of, you know, the, to, to complete the feedback loop. Um, but, but my only thought is that, Maybe, maybe the trick is is more to you know to, to use EU funding to subvert the the kind of you know the, the bureaucratic narrow agenda or if if it you know if immigration policy has been colonised by very conservative um, people from the Netherlands or, or where else you know um, you know, try to you know we I, I suppose one, once we've taken the money. From the EU as a as a postdoc or as a um, as a principal investigator, I don't think you're beholden to the EU to to come up with policy, you know, recommendations or knowledge that they require. You know, in the sense that our universities still protect us with this sort of idea, in, in, at least in theory, uh, that you know, in academic freedom means that we should be able to. Um, to, to interpret our, our data and come up with um, different ways of uh, doing that. We, we don't have to speak back their, their language. And finally, you know, the EU is not a, a unified actor in any sense. And even within the commission that, you know, there are, you'll find different officials who have different positions. Um, and probably the best way to, to get the European Commission to act is to make alliances with the European Parliament because MEPs, are much more receptive uh, to public opinion. They are always looking for, you know, ways of influencing um, the Commission. And, and I, I think maybe a, a good strategy would be to team up with concerned MEPs and try to, um, you know, write our critical reports and our op-eds in, um, in alignment with them, because I, I think many of them probably would agree uh, with you know, with the kind of knowledge that you're producing. Can I say something, Maria or Shora? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think we, I mean, thanks, Chris and, and Maria. And, and to pick up on that last point, I know that both Barak and I have already discussed, you know, like how do you subvert the use of this fund? I think both of us have, have done it in a range of way through how we distribute this money once we get it, how we channel it to different uh, actors, groups, activist groups, etc. I know that uh, in my topic on solidarity practices, that's obviously something that comes up because my, uh, you know, key interlocutors are people who are involved in subversive political practices in that field. And of course, I work with them and support them in as much as I can. But I think that doesn't, you know, sort of resolve the broader question of first uh, sort of commodification of our knowledge on the broader scale, the issue of the fragmentation of our rights and precarization of our contracts as presumably mostly as a, a early career academics, but I think also further down, down the line. And uh, and then, you know, there's the all other uh, issues that you've 
brought up of uh, how do we influence in general as academics or as other actors uh, migration policy at the European level, which, you know, that issue of do we side with uh, MEPs, do we side with, do we try to push against the increasingly conservative commission, that's of course a very important debate, but I think even in that equation, and I have done reports for various left groups at the uh, European Parliament, their margin of maneuver in uh, shaping European migration policy is super limited as well. Um, but not to say that it's not something we should not be doing more massively, but uh, I think all those strategies are interesting, but they also have their limits and they're, they're all connected, but there are different issues as well, you know, like uh, shaping migration policy and shaping higher education policies. There are two debates that uh, we should have sort of jointly, but also think about a little bit separately. And I think the ASA has done a great job in terms of bringing the issue of academic precarity uh, on the agenda. And I know Maria, perhaps you can tell us more about it, that you were pushing for, for instance, uh, the inclusion of certain regulation regarding postdocs uh, and, you know, minimum sort of <laughs> provisions for labor rights of like uh, people who can be in extremely structurally subaltern relationships, because for instance, if you enter an ERC project or as a postdoc or as a PhD uh, candidate, you really structurally at the mercy of your uh, principal investigator. So if you're lucky and you have like uh, someone who's both aware and committed to not reproduce insane academic hierarchies and terrible working conditions, that's great, but you know, that's very much an, arbit uh, an arbitrary uh, situation of which kind of PI you, you get to. So I think that's also this issue of the super individualization of research that animates EU research funding. And it links in with what you were saying, Barack, about, you know, the EU imagination of an academic career. You start with a Marie Curie, and then maybe you like uh, coordinate the work package in an H2020, and then your PI for H2020, and then you get your ERC. And the more you go along this path, the more uh, sort of competitive you, you become, and you keep reproducing that particular idea of what's the new sort of not really attached to any nation state uh, uh, academic system because you have mobility requirements at different stages. So you're moving around, you're very much like uprooted. Um, and that's also a very specific image of the role of academics and their relation to an imagined European space, which we know not to exist, <laughs> but you're supposed to circulate freely floating across, you know, that political uh, sphere that is European in essence and super liberal, etc. So I think those are also things we might want to think about. Perhaps it goes with what you were saying, Maria, but how to be root certain things. Yeah, and again, I'd, I'd really like more people to join the conversation. And I, I don't, I think like the fact that we invited two people who had um, a Marie Curie or ERC doesn't mean that those who haven't had them can't, um, you know, share their experience, including of national level funding, because that's another kind of forms. So we're now targeting EU funding also because we, as a European association, can probably be more active on a general level that can have repercussion you know nationally but national funding agencies are not less problematic or or less colonizing i think colonizing is a good word to to use here also you know referring to what chara said but but in terms of you know we're, we're working in a field where on the so so there's so many levels at which like coloniality of power works you know so we you're starting with the level of your research participants, you know, who are extracted from their data with a kind of promise that maybe you would be helping them, maybe somehow someday, that then you know, moves on to your local interlocutors, who can be sometimes scholars, research assistants, and so forth on the on the ground, who are usually, and that's another question, you know, how are they paid, how how much you know the redistribution happens on that level and how equal it is because many of them might be paid but might not get um, authorship or you know right to to speak and then you know we then we kind of work up to the level of the food chain where a lot of uh, scholarship nowadays is not scholarship really it's management because you know you show that you're able to manage big grants 
you know, so so by the time that uh, you kind of have gone up that ladder, and I, I don't want to point to Chara and Marak here, you know, that's not the, the point, but, you know, by the time that you've kind of come up the ladder of, of all these funding streams and, you know, managing packages and so forth, a lot of times you don't have time to do research. You can't take a train. You have to send a postdoc to take the train, and in the meantime, you have to file in a report. So, so more and more, we are not even engaging directly in this food chain with our interlocutors, research participants, but we are managing, you know, levels of funding and levels of labor that that we can't even influence. You know, we can't. You, there's not even a structure that allows you, if you hire a postdoc within a year, see, to allow them to be in a career ladder that that gets them into a permanent position, let alone anything else. So, so there's something very violent in that chain. And it's true by the time that you've kind of reached the level that, you know, you're given all the security, um, you've actually had to pass through a lot of corpses on the way, so to speak. So this is something that, yeah, I think Barak wants to speak to. Yeah, I uh, want to jump in. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Maria, for taking the the discussion to where you did. And uh, but I want to go back to the comment by Chris, and um, I want to actually insist that yeah, we should be surprised because uh, if we're not surprised, it's actually that we're not doing justice to how the game is being played. Because, and I can speak from my experience. When I finished my ERC, I had to write like a huge. Uh, if I, uh, I had to write like a huge content report with recommendations, policy recommendations, but it also had to be a huge financial report of my entire project for five years. And I don't know how much money that went into it. Now, my content report, that was something like 40 pages, was never, I think, read by anyone. I never, ever got any comments for it. Whereas my financial report went back and forth from the European Commission for six months, it was eventually also audited externally by PricewaterhouseCoopers, which God know how much money was going into that. And I mean, why should I not be surprised? You know, I think if we are allowing ourselves to just take it all for as if it's self-evident, and of course this is what it is. I mean, we're not doing justice to how the game is played. I think this kind of uh, not accepting it and thinking, well, why are there mechanisms for financial audit, but there are no mechanism for accountability to policy making on the content of what we have found, whereas the, EU, uh, the EC is constantly claiming that he's doing evidence-based policy. So something is really rotten, and I think we should, I mean, the only hope we have is that if we keep surpri being surprised about it, not just taking it, you know, with a pinch of salt and saying, well, this is how it is, you know? Can I come back on that? I, I definitely wasn't uh, advocating that we take it as it is and, and, and treat it as a fait accompli. No, I, I'm saying we shouldn't be surprised because yeah, we know the nature of the game, but I'm, I'm completely with you. I mean, I'm, I'm disgusted at the way that, and I think Maria uses the word colonization absolutely spot on. You know, what, what we've seen is that the latest phase in, if you like, academic capitalism has resulted in the total colonization of research funding by a, a, a set of external um, consultants and advisors, yeah, generally KPMG, PwC, Ernst & Young, Deloitte, um, and, and a handful of others, McKinsey and so on. And the commission, you know, has either been captured by them or is part of this logic, but... Uh, yeah, call them out. I'm, I'm completely with you on this. I think um, if we have the courage to do that, and this is where we need our professional societies to, to come in rather than junior academics who have just sort of one step away from the PhD who are going to feel vulnerable. I mean, it's, it's quite brave to bite the hand that feeds you. Um, but this kind of corruption of, of a kind of, a, of an institution and a funding mechanism really does need to be highlighted and foregrounded and we, we can do whatever we can to expose it because it really needs to change and i agree i mean i, I i've never been <laughs> privileged or burdened by an erc grant but from what i can see they are potentially incredibly corrupting and very very damaging to all sorts of people 
certainly, you know, the, the, the junior researchers on them and sometimes even for the principal investigator. <laughs> Yeah, uh, okay. can I jump in? So, yeah, thanks, Chris. I, uh, so I think we're definitely on the same place. I think the word corruption is very due here in this discussion in how money is actually funneled through this, like Maria was saying, through these big grants actually to sponsor or finance this kind of huge neoliberalized mechanism that the university has turned out to be. Um, but I also want to go back to something that uh, Chawra, you said about, uh, well, do we have another option? Is it only fail again, fail better? And I want to suggest that we might do. I mean, I don't know where it will take us, but I mean, I'm thinking a bit more like becoming abolitionist about these big grants. I never applied, by the way, for another big grant after my experience. I thought, okay, also given the kind of account that I have of it, I, I don't want to participate in it anymore. I really feel almost ashamed that I've taken part in it in the first place. So I think, yeah, we can, we can also become a bit more radical. I'm not sure where it takes us because like you say, if we don't pick up this money from the floor, someone else will. And maybe that someone will actually reproduce that system even more. And is that something good? I don't know, but I think this is where our thinking has to go to. And also with respect to like take the money and run with it and do subversive thing. I know for sure that Selena's done it and many other colleagues that I know have done it. I've done it myself to, that, to an extent that because this is recorded, I cannot share with you what I've done. But I cannot also tell you that it's so satisfying, you know, because I also realized that at the end of the game, I got so much money. Some of it I managed to subvert, but it's really the, the, the very small, tiny part of it that was up for that. And I cannot, I, I mean, I cannot pat myself on the shoulder and say, look what you've done, you've done great. You took the money and you made it work in different ways. So I'm getting much more into the abolitionist uh, idea about this uh, game. And I'm worried about it as all of you probably, like I don't know where it takes us if, if some of us that are more engaged actually and concerned We'll do that, but I think that I also don't see the, I'm also not satisfied by fa uh, fail better, fail, fail again, fail better. Sandana, you wanted, uh, uh, you had a, a question yeah. before, before. and yeah, then sure. uh, Prem Kumar, okay. Okay, so um, I was just going to say that, you know, it's, it's not just a, an issue that it's not used. Um, it's also that in its uh, disregard, it's being used in a particular way. So it, it actually performs the function of showing the EU to be self-critical, um, ready to re-examine policies. And, you know, it, it's actually, they have it in their back pocket. There's something they can pull out uh, by saying, look, we funded all this research and it was really critical of our policies. And, you know, in, in a way, it's a way of muting that opposition. So it's, it's, it, it actually is being used. You know, it's not being not used. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the point that you were making, Chara, uh, about, you know, um, how can it be an option to, just uh, walk away from it. And I, Barack is making a very persuasive case because as I was writing this, he was speaking about his abolitionist sort of stance towards it. It's a, it's a strong case, but you know there'll be people, we know that within anthropology, uh, there is a very neoliberal stream coming through and that there will be people who will actually, you know, take this money and do something really terrible with it. So just that question to throw into the mix. There was another question uh, uh, or comment. Yeah, I think that might have been me. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to the speakers. It was in the organization, uh, the organizers. It's really nice to hear this. I think it's a super important um set of questions to discuss um i want to say something which is a uh, maybe a little obvious and i know that the, um, that, that the speakers are well aware of this and this is a more general point um i think it's important to sometimes to provincialize or move away from the focus on eu funding 
Um, I'm not saying this is what is happening here, but I've seen elsewhere where there's a tendency to focus on the on EU on the EU as a mechanism that reproduces um, inequality in higher education. Yes, it does that, but it didn't invent inequality in higher education. And it doesn't mean that we remove or and I totally agree with Maria about moving funding away, public funding away from what the commission and the democrats or universities. It doesn't mean that we are going to um, to to have a um, um, <laughs> an equal or fair or even interesting disbursement of funding. And I also don't think it is um, neoliberal either. It is neoliberal, but neoliberalism reproduces a sense of inequality that has existed already in universities and has had its um, uh, its um, its entrenchment in the way universities function, certainly in the Western world. It's partly to do with prestige and partly to do in the way in which certain forms of prestige is tied to certain forms of material reward against um, the, um, you know, the, the, the control of the work of others, the reducing of uh, junior professors and adjuncts to very, um, very poor material positions. So my point is, is that it's important to try to move away from to acknowledge the EU's role in all of this, but to also understand that the EU, I don't believe, invented the structure of inequality, but furthered it certainly, and the structure of inequality remains deeply embedded into how we produce knowledge in universities today. The university where I'm from, Central Europe University, um, when they were in Hungary, they've moved from Hungary now, been whatever, kicked out of Hungary now. Um, the salaries that people got there were literally eight to 10 times higher than people in other Hungarian universities. The differences between a professor's salary and an assistant professor's salary um, or a postdoc salary or a staff member's salary is huge. And I certainly neoliberalism plays, has a part to play in this, but a certain idea of knowledge and knowledge production, the prestige attached to it, enables academics in certain positions um, to gain control of, uh, of funds, collective social funds for the university. And, they, and these funds become privatized into salaries. It is partly neoliberalism, but I don't believe it is entirely neoliberalism. I think this process has been going on for a while, and I think it's is reproduced by the European Commission and by neoliberalism, but it is not, uh, they are not the end all and be all of this process. Thank you very much. And, and maybe I, uh, if, if there is a, uh, uh, I, I can use a, a, a bit of time also to, I, I would like to, to make a few points that are uh, in relation with, with you. You just say, um, about the fact that you know uh, uh, the social impact, going back to the social impact, and I'm, I'm I totally agree with you, Barack, that we should be abolitionist as a horizon, but but then you know try to keep the power balance within the field of knowledge. Now that it's, it's uh, uh, the year ERC fundings are no, there is no disappearance of these fundings that fight, but as we should fight for their their abolition, uh, and um, uh, we can. Uh, um, I mean, what I meant is that you you still you will still have the paradox of our little social impact as academics, even if there is no ERC funding, and there is no way that you I mean, and and we we haven't been able collectively to address that. Not only us, but also us with the civil society, with the NGOs, with the uh, uh, all our partners that are uh, uh, working in in similar. Uh, with, with similar paradox, the jury, et cetera. So it's something that, so the sale again sell better was that, okay, you won't make it disappear. So what do you do, you do with it? And um, um, uh, as much as I agree with the, with the abolitionist uh, um, uh, stand, and I think that maybe it's, it's one of the things that can come out of this webinar as a, you know, uh, uh, a consensus on, okay, they, we, there is a, um, I'm taking a journal, I'm, I'm keeping a journal of all the, the flows and the corruptions, as you say, that this uh, uh, ESC research is, uh, is producing in the, in the creation of knowledge. But there is also resources. 
and uh, uh, and and these resources are important uh, uh, when when it's uh, uh, about creating an alliance between the academic world and uh, uh, some other uh, let, let's say some other functions of uh, um, um, uh, critical thinking, such as people who will who 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 can help us, like uh, have publication strategies to to target uh, uh, the media or to. I mean, this is uh, something also we can develop. Like we can use those uh, uh, projects uh, to to uh, strengthen up, uh, um, have the vision on 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 social impact. And the reason why I'm saying that is that. Uh, to go back to the EU um, uh, and, and the, the interview I had with Elspeth Pitt, what she was saying is that, okay, the, we, we shouldn't, at the end of, of the day also, we, we should remember that the capacity to rethink has been here in the past and, and, and changes can come. I mean, at one point, no one believed that there would be an EU enlargement to the uh, uh, post-Soviet world and to the... Uh, uh, East European countries in 2004, and and this happened. But uh, uh, if we don't think that that we have a chance to reverse those trends, as a, at least as a horizon, so keeping together the you know the abolitionist uh, uh, efforts and uh, uh, the idea that um, all this is a question of perception. It's not a question of facts, and we know that as, as scholars. It's not like migration control is, is not a question of facts, it's a question of dealing with perception, and those perceptions can be changed. So, so we still you know, remain with, with, with the question of our, our social impact and, 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 uh, and, and maybe uh, how, how we can, uh, I mean, yeah, we, we, we cannot escape, uh, uh, I guess, that. And, and in this regard, the, the, the last thing was, my, my question is that, uh, critical research, getting EU ERC funding, is this an accident? Is this because evaluators are scholars themselves, so they can, you know, there they are different uh, criteria of uh, 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 evaluating a, a research so that our, our pairs and, and colleagues can get uh, some critical thinking uh, research by accident being funded by the uh, EU Commission? Or is it even something that tells us something about the place of academic knowledge? It is, it is part of the game. We are producing a critical knowledge and it, and it doesn't serve anything, but it's, so, so then, you know, and, and this is something, even if there is no ERC and there is no, uh, uh, those big research, we, we will be still stuck with this problem. In the US, they're stuck with this problem as well. And I, I'm thinking of Bill Reading's book, University, the University in Ruins, published in 1997. And where he was like doing a, a very accurate uh, a critique of the word excellence as exactly its contrary, and this was the and, and, and this was the demobilization and the depoliticization of critical research way be before even you know the ERC. So yeah, that was. So maybe the, you know I I think I mean I would both agree and disagree with Prem to to the extent of you know, the centrality of EU knowledge. So I think the EU has made itself an easy victim maybe of our critique because it has been all about um, transparency, accountability, impact, you know, that it, and, and in a way, like the problem is that you, you have much more, cle much clearer kind of ways of at least structurally, you know, feeding back into the institution that funds you with you funding than you do with the Bulgarian national funding streams, believe me. <laughs> and I think you know that from Hungary very well. So so we're also in a in a situation where you know it is very clear that this is public funding. Um, it is a very small percentage of the funding that European research receives is EU funding. Is like five seven percent. You know the rest is national agencies and so forth. But the but the percentage of private funding is even smaller. You know so that that's also something to take into account. So we are dealing with hugely publicly funded research, and and one can do things with that. But I think we we are sometimes you know when when focusing on research, 
we're forgetting the other side of education, which is also, you know, which is teaching, yeah? So which is, how do we produce knowledge with students? And then on that level, we're also under quite a significant attack. And I think in 1997, similarly, but, you know, we're, we're now at, at the peak of it, um, which is that by now research is, so, so there's a kind of very nasty chain of events. You know, on the one hand, our institutions are evaluated on research and research funding and it's top university that get gifts and they get it more and more and more and they become more attractive to fee paying students and they come to be taught by excellent researchers. Those excellent researchers buy themselves out from teaching. So, so in a certain way, you know, part of the impact that we're doing through this research that we say, you know, we're going to be distributing knowledge, well, we're not doing because we're trying to buy ourselves out of teaching because teaching is also becoming more and more abusive and it's becoming more and more, how do you, you know, like we're asked every day, how do we make sure that our students get jobs on the job market? And you're like, well, you know, 20 years ago, nobody asked me this question. You know, I didn't ask this question when I studied philosophy in Bulgaria. How, like, would my faculty members, you know, like my professors give me the skills to go out on the job market? But there were things that I learned from them, you know. But nowadays we're we're more and more turned on the one hand, you know, we're turning into vocational training institutions, even the most kind of research-oriented institutions. And then on the other hand, you know, we're luring people in through this you know, impactful research. And the impactful research usually means getting 97% of public funding for AstraZeneca vaccine and then having AstraZeneca buy, the, not buy, but like own the patent for it. So, so there's something there that's like really, really wrong and true. And, and I think it didn't come with the EU, but the EU really kind of plays a, a forefront of where this kind of public-private um, clashes and and we have the possibility to uh, hold it accountable which is less the case I'm afraid in the case of Orban or you know Boyko Borisov so so there is something still more democratic possibly there I think for now Maybe, so thank you Maria we are we are running a little bit uh, out of time so Celine uh, and uh, Barak, uh, maybe we can give you the floor for a last round of, of reactions and discussions because it was before we close. Uh, thanks, Shara. I actually wanted to make slightly similar points to what Maria was just saying about how I actually, of course, the EU did not invent, you know, privatization of knowledge and uh, commodification of higher education. But I think it did play a very crucial role in uh, furthering it. Uh, and, and the other point I wanted to, to make that Maria also made is the way in which it spreads out um, forms of inequality on this regional level, uh, because institutions that have a more prestige, prestige capital end up, you know, often being uh, identified along old, you know, north, south, east, west lines. And then you see how this kind of solidifies existing hierarchies that are also not invented by the European Union project per se, but which we know have been sort of institutionalized and, uh, and sort of have very much cemented in the, in the institutional structure of the, of the European Union. But unlike Maria, and I know it's not a very helpful conclusion, I'm really not sure that there is more democratic accountability in the European model of doing politics. So I know, and having been in, in Hungary uh, as well, I, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. And, and the idea that actually remains, uh, you know, at least uh, on the table there that uh, by skipping in a way the national uh, <laughs> level, which has become uh, so uh, difficult to engage with, we, we get more a possibility for change. Perhaps that's also why I changed. I finished on this experience that we had with Spinar, where actually European funding didn't protect us against the sort of most minimal exercise of our academic uh, activities of both research and teaching. You know, and we were in fact to some extent targeted because we had European funding, and that might be sort of specific to the political configuration of Hungary. But we also were criminalized in spite of European funding. And there was absolutely nothing that uh, I was in, both at a very concrete level in touch with, you know, the project coordinator of my European funding, which was like, oh, no, we certainly do not interfere in national politics when it comes to anything, in including, you know, higher education. 
but also I think at a deeper level, perhaps, you know, connecting it to Chris's uh, comment, like, why should we be surprised when we know the way in which actually a lot of decision ma making is removed <laughs> from a more accessible uh, scale of local politics through its inclusion into European level policy making. I'm not sure there's much hope for democracy mechanism at the European level, but that's just my, my uh, perspective at least. Um, and yeah, Barak, maybe you want to add something depressing. <laughs> I will add if there is time. Yeah. Okay. I have four very small points. Uh, I will try to finish actually on a not depressive one. So, starting with the depressive ones, uh, speaking to the point that Chandana raised about the doing research is also actually being something that um, helps the EU to wave uh, in front of uh, whomever is needed to, uh, to say, look, we invested so much money in it. Of course, we are concerned about it. Of course, it's a matter of importance for us. Um, what I think is very telling there is that we tried in our project to do research, and it was, of course, in our proposal, and we got budgeted for it with Frontex, but we never got access. Although we tried for over two years to get access to Frontex, we just didn't get access. And I beg you to think of another field in which the EU would fund the research, let's say chemistry, and then we'll build for you a lab, but then say, oh, sorry, you don't have access to the material that you need to you know, work with in your experiments. So if you need, if you need a, a, an example of how the game is actually skewed in ways that this money from coming from the EU for research in this field is actually not meant to produce critical knowledge, but just to do something else, which I think is very problematic. And we have to think, what is this something else? And I think we went a lot into the reproduction of the academic field as a neoliberalized one, maybe even too, too far in that, forgetting that, of course, the money in the first place was meant to do research about the dire situation in which all these cross borders are in. And I think by pouring so much money and having no impact, we really also reproduce uh, a lot the issue of the, of the migrant as being the problem. Of course, because we're never resolving it. We're not adding anything to the solution of it. So what we're actually ending up doing is we reproduce the issue like, okay, migration and refugees is, is a huge problem. And here is a lot of money. And I just want to also share with you that eventually in June, we got a reply from the, from the European Union. Uh, the one that wrote us back was the commissioner for, uh, I had to write it down because it's such a long title. It's the commissioner for innovation, research, culture, education, and youth, Maria Gabriel. And okay. in, yeah, another Maria. <laughs> and uh, among the other things that she said, uh, like the highlight of her letter back was, oh, don't worry, we just allocated another 100 million euro for research on migration. Right, so you have to, we have to all come to terms with that idea that it's not an innocent thing that we just take the money and maybe we will do something critical and maybe we will subvert it in, in a good way. Just by participating in it, we are already reproducing something that is quite uh, clearly, I think, meant to do something else than what we are doing, we are pretending to do. And um, the last thing that I want to say and that is a bit of an uplifting point is that at the moment in the Netherlands about the national funding level, there is a lot of criticism that accumulated already for some years. And there's just been a report uh, published by some of my colleagues, uh, literally calling for the abolition of this kind of national funding, saying like every anthropologist that has a position in any university should get an equal share of, depending on her percentage of work, uh, in the institution of funding for doing research. And if researchers want to group together and do a big project, of course they can do that. But all that idea of we are all competing in a neoliberal fashion for this kind of a winner takes it all is just a sick game. And it's much, I think, standing to reason that we will also think, okay, uh, why don't we really move into something a bit more radical and call for this abolition, you know? And not just trying to reform it ourselves with our own subversive uh, inclination in a good way. So on this note, <laughs> uh, I think that uh, uh, there there uh, are some notes that uh, uh, Chris uh, 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 took the the 
the I mean the effort to to, to take some note uh, of this uh, uh, meeting. So maybe uh, uh, we can also share the the, the, the results of, of this kind of collective uh, uh, discussion. And I think that uh, uh, it was a very uh, uh, it was very thought provoking and also uh, it's very refreshing to to be sharing uh, uh, these ideas because the, the, there is no place dedicated to, to uh, usually to those, those kind of uh, 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 critical uh, uh, thinking about what these conditions of work, uh, of, of knowledge production make us produce as knowledge. And I, I listening to you also, Barak, I was, I was thinking, yes, we, we sure have to do what I mean, kind of decolonize our minds from those those uh, bureaucratic rules, etc. That research is imposing not only on us. Uh, I mean, not only on those who have research projects, but also all those who prepare research projects and like you know prepare their CV for the because because it has totally permeated all the the, the academic culture. So uh, um, there is a maybe there are some really. Uh, 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 tangible points that can be drawn from this discussion, that's what I wanted to say, and, and, and these can be circulated. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for both the discussion and enabling it also to be recorded so that we can maybe uh, share it with those who could not be with us today. Uh, and I hope that uh, it's uh, just the, the start of uh, a conversation, many, many things Still, I, I guess have to be said, like how Greece has been a wonderful laboratory of, you know, those politics, etc. Uh, how we can relate to uh, uh, the, the 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 challenges at the at the um, national level for the elections that are to come, and and uh, 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 you know uh, how to rethink the place of expert knowledge in those uh, very uh, 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 specific political challenges that await us. So um, maybe, so uh, I don't know, Maria, maybe we want to uh, just uh, finish this conference, uh, this webinar by reminding if there are other uh, uh, next programs. And I will uh, uh, thank our uh, uh, participants and I will thank Barak and Celine for sharing their thoughts with us uh, and leave you the floor. Thank you. Very much. Thanks. Thanks, Chora. And thanks, Celine and Barak. And yes, yeah, so we are going to be having more discussions also on open science and we're going to connect all the kind of again structural and political levels so don't worry it's not going to be liberal fluff but for the for the rest i mean we are in connection with some lobby groups and we are trying through being EASA and being representative body of anthropologists and social sciences in europe to make this discussion come to the european table like how much further we can go we don't know but I think it is a good start to at least start calling things with their own names and try getting people accountable or, you know, showing that there are other ways. And I think what Barak said at the end is uplifting in indeed, that there are other ways to do meaningful research and we will fight for them locally, nationally, regionally, globally. Eh? <laughs> Um, we will be in touch about the next dates for the webinars. There will be one a month from now on until the end of the year. So stay tuned and thanks. Thanks all. Thanks also to Jan from Nomad IT who has been with us and has been immense help. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.